when I got a call to come and introduce the senator, uh, I was pretty excited about that because you know, I go back a long way on, about uh, Senator Bingham. And I've known Senator Bingham since the early 70s, so you can tell how old I am. Senator Bingham was born in Silver City in uh, 1943, graduated from Silver City High School. His father worked for Western. Then he went on to Harvard, then went on to Stanford, got a law degree, and does all those great things. But then he came back and he married a marvelous person named Ann. And if Ann was here, she would probably be our guest speaker. <laughs> She's an outstanding person, but I understand. So he comes, comes back and uh, he's in law practice with who I think was one of the best governors we ever had, which is Governor Jack Campbell. And there was a person named Black, who is now a Supreme Court, what's he, Court of Appeals? Federal District Court, and that was their law firm. And if you stop and think of it, you say, well, that, that's sort of impressive. It was really impressive. And we had to have, and I can say this as being partisan, but, but we had to have a Republican senator that was coming up for re-election in 1982. And I know I was involved with a lot of people trying to encourage our Attorney General because he just finished his first, was it, did you do two terms as Attorney General? One term as Attorney General, and he was an outstanding Attorney General. And we have here this attractive, young, educated, super person that would be great to be our candidate for United States Senator. And the senator he beat was a Republican, and, and the senator told me that it was probably one of the only races in the country where the incumbent was defeated. But then he goes on to the Senate, and of course in the Senate he joined Pete Domenici. Good, for Pete's a good guy, but I can be a little partisan. He's a Republican, but he's a good guy. <laughs> and Jeff goes on to the United States Senate. And what I've been told by a number of people in the Senate, there could be a better a class act. And today's Senate is so much different than what I believe it used to be when they, they worked together. I've always noticed with Jeff is that he stands for principle. You don't say you don't have all these negative things happen. He's he is bright. He, you you can tell that he knows what he's doing. And then when he goes there, he becomes chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources from 2001 to 2002, and then again in 2007. And to end of his term in Congress, 112th Congress. Jeff played a major role in the passage of the Energy Policy Act, the first comprehensive energy bill to become law in 13 years. He's a leader and sponsor of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, which required a historic increase in, in the very few, few economy. He served the Senate Finance Committee, Subcommittee Health Care. He also served the Senate Health and Education. But when you talk about Senator Bingham, is that when, we, when he decided to retire, it was a bad day for the university. You know, seniority is so important in the Senate. And we had two senators, one Republican and one Democrat. And if those two hadn't worked together, we wouldn't have Sandia. We wouldn't have Los Alamos. We wouldn't have had Clovis. We wouldn't have had any of the things that are there today. The two of them worked together for New Mexico. They might have opposed each other politically when we were uh, having campaigns. So I'm thrilled to death to be able to introduce who I consider my friend, Senator Jeff Bainer. Jamie, thank you very much, and uh, let me thank you for all your service to our state and a great many different varieties. Uh, Jamie's always been a force for constructive progress in New Mexico, and he's been a great supporter and friend of mine during all my political involvement, so I very much appreciate the kind introduction. Thank you for letting me speak to you today, and I was... I was sort of forewarned that uh, you were going to have a speaker this morning, uh, Professor Shook from uh, Yale Law School, who had just come out with a book uh, about uh, why the federal government or why the government fails so often. So I uh, read the book and I uh, thought I would say a few things about his conclusions as a way to get into the subject about how to how we can work to make the government function better and fail less. Uh, 
My general view on this issue of failure at the federal level, first of all, let me say, say that the campaign that just concluded yesterday or last night uh, had a lot of focus, the campaign that I, at least that I observed, had a lot of focus on failures of the government in one way or another. Uh, so I think that subject is, is a, uh, a very uh, logical one. I don't know the extent to which your conferences are, are concentrating on it, but I think it is a very uh, salient uh, issue at this time in our history. My general view on the issue has three parts. First, uh, I, I would agree with the conclusion that Professor Shuck has in his book that many programs and policies that we've enacted in Washington have fallen short in achieving their objectives. But uh, as to some of those policies, I believe that uh, it's a mistake to, make, to label them as failures. I think uh, they have largely succeeded, even though they have uh, had shortcomings. Second uh, point I'll make is that uh, we would benefit from broadening the discussion uh, about failures uh, to not just discuss talk, not to just talk about failures of commission, but also failures of omission by the government. And third, uh, since ground zero for failure and dysfunction in the federal government is the Congress, at least in the view of most, and, and in my view, uh, I'll explain what I consider to be three of the most significant causes of that dysfunction in recent years. So on the first issue of whether there are substantial problems and shortcomings uh, that can be identified in federal programs and policies, I agree that there are. Uh, I also believe that uh, it's a mistake to take the fact of those shortcomings and conclude that the policies are failures. There, I'll give you three examples where Professor Shook has concluded that the policies and programs are failures where I would disagree. First, Medicare. Although I agree with some of the criticisms of the Medicare program, uh, and I agree that we're going to have to make some changes in order to ensure that it is solvent long term, uh, I do not consider it to be, have been a failure. There are tens of millions of Americans, 65 and older, who are benefiting from Medicare today. Uh, the latest figures I have are that there are over 47 or 49 million Americans enrolled in Medicare today. Second uh, example that he uh, cites as a failure is the student loan program. Uh, as regards the student loan program, I recognize that there are problems with the program. I'm sure most of you do as well. Uh, and uh, again, I would not conclude that those problems would cause me to label it a failure. My own preference would be, and was when I was in the Senate, uh, to have a much smaller student loan program and a much more generous grant and aid program. Uh, that would ensure that fewer students who graduate would have to pay off very large amounts of debt. Unfortunately, the reality is that in Washington, uh, we don't have the political support in Congress to enact a larger grant and aid program. The student loan program is clearly a second best option, but even with its current failings, design flaws, uh, it does enable many students to attend college who otherwise would not be able to. There are over 12 million students benefiting from that program today. And the, the final uh, example I'll cite uh, from Professor Shook's uh, list of failed programs is uh, he, he talks about the green energy or clean energy production tax credits as, as failed policies. And he labels them as failed policies, uh, and points out, pointing out that only 12.6% of the tax subsidies that we provide for energy production go to the production of energy from fossil fuels, while fossil fuels account for 78% of the energy that we produce. At the same time, renewable energy gets 77% of those tax subsidies. 
Uh, I don't dispute those facts, but uh, to my mind, the more relevant question is why any of the tax subsidy that we provide to encourage energy production should be targeted to produce more fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency has strongly urged all countries to end their subsidies of fossil fuels, and it's clear to me that we have an overabundance of fossil fuels even without any subsidies. So the question of uh, how much uh, we should do to promote development of renewable energy or clean energy depends on how serious you consider the problem of global warming to be. My own view is that it is a serious problem. We need to have strong policies in place to confront it. The policies we have in place are not ideal, but again, they are moving us in the right direction, and I would not uh, label them as failures. The second point uh, which I believe needs to be emphasized is that failures of the federal government can come in two forms. Failures of commission, where the government has acted and adopt, to adopt a policy or program which is being criticized, or failures of omission, where the government has failed to act or chosen not to act. The discussion to date has primarily been about failures of commission, and I would say that the recent campaigns have been about failures of commission. Uh, I think we would benefit as a country from broadening the discussion to failures of omission as well. President Roosevelt made the same point in his speech in Philadelphia, accepting the Democratic Party nomination for a second term in 1936. In that speech, he said the following, Governments can err. Presidents do make mistakes. But the immortal Dante tells us that divine justice weighs the sins of the cold-blooded and the sins of the warm-hearted in different scales. Better the occasional faults of a government that lives in a spirit of charity than the consistent omissions of a government frozen in the ice of its own indifference. I think FDR was right to be concerned about what he called the consistent omissions of government. And the failures that deserve our attention should include those consistent omissions as well as the commissions. The third and final issue I wanted to talk about is this issue of dysfunction in the Congress, and I'll go on a little longer about that since that's where I've spent substantial time. Uh, Professor Shuck writes in his book that, quote, Congress is the single greatest institutional source of government failure. I agree with that opinion. I believe most Americans agree with that opinion as well, and perhaps the results of the extrajudice elections would confirm that. I, I first went to the Senate in 1983, as, as Jamie was describing, uh, and at that time I did not believe, and in my opinion most Americans did not believe, that the Congress was the dysfunctional body that it since has become. So what's changed? What has changed to get us to the point that we're at today? There are obviously external factors that have contributed to the problem. There are also factors internal to the Congress that relate to how the Congress does its own business. Uh, the external factors that have damaged the functioning of Congress include the polarization of the electorate and the strong role that the media has played in reinforcing that polarization. Uh, the dramatic enlargement of the lobbying industry in Washington, the increased influence of money and special interests in our election campaigns. We were just talking here before I sp stood up to speak about the enormous amounts of money spent on some of the Senate races around the country. A hundred million dollars was spent in the Senate race in North Carolina. Uh, Sixty-three million dollars was spent in the Senate race in Colorado, next our neighbor state. Uh, these are all external factors that I think have, have contributed to the dysfunction of our, of our Congress. But there are also internal factors. Changes in the way that Congress itself functions 
that have played a major part in adding to the dysfunction of Congress. I'll mention three of these internal factors, each of which I believe have been major causes of dysfunction. Each of these factors, I believe that each of these is new in that uh, it has become a serious cause of dysfunction only in the last couple of decades. Before I discuss the, these causes, these three causes of dysfunction, I believe it's useful to ask what, what are the responsibilities of Congress? What do we expect the Congress to do? If, we, if we're saying it's not getting the job done, what, what is it we expect it to do? Those of you who are constitutional scholars recall that, that the duties of the Congress are enumerated in Article 1, Section 8 and 9 of the Constitution, and they are numerous. However, even before you get to that long list of enumerated responsibilities, I believe that there are three threshold or core responsibilities which the Founding Fathers thought they were lodging in the Congress. And these responsibilities are pretty, pretty common sense. First, there's a responsibility on the part of the Congress to raise money so that we can have a government. Second, there's a responsibility to appropriate money to pay for a functioning government. And third, there's a responsibility to permit borrowing to the extent that that's needed to meet the obligations incurred by the government. Now, much of the dysfunction which we have seen in Congress in recent years, in my view, is the result of the refusal, not the failure, the refusal of the Republican congressional leadership to carry out two of these three core responsibilities. And, and the two I'm talking about are the refusal to appropriate money to maintain a functioning government and the refusal to permit borrowing to meet the obligations of government. The refusal of Republican congressional leaders to carry out those two core responsibilities plus the excessive and abusive use of the filibuster in the Senate are, in my opinion, three major factors at the heart of the dysfunction we see in Congress. I'll briefly discuss each of these causes. First, the refusal to appropriate money. That same Article I of the Constitution that I just referred to says the following, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. So it's clear that Congress has to act in order for money to be spent. The ideal, which almost never is achieved, is for Congress to pass appropriations bills and to send those to the President before the beginning of each fiscal year. That, that is, of course, October 1. And as we all know, the reality in Washington uh, has been very different from this ideal. In fact, Congress usually gets to the beginning of a new fiscal year, or gets to October 1, with some or all of the appropriations bills not having been completed. And to deal with the situation, Congress has had a practice of adopting short-term spending bills or continuing resolutions to keep the government funded while they continue to work on longer-term appropriation bills. This is not an ideal solution. But it does keep federal agencies open, and it keeps federal employees at work. That so-called normal practice of passing short-term spending bills until full appropriations bills can be completed was abandoned by the Republican leadership in the House of Representatives in 1995. In that year, some of you may remember, when negotiations between congressional Republicans and President Clinton on spending levels in different programs failed to reach a conclusion, the Republican leadership in the Congress chose not to enact a continuing resolution to maintain a functioning government. In a telling statement at that time, Speaker Gingrich said, and this is his quote, if you're going to operate with the President's veto being the ultimate Trump, you have to operate within a very narrow range of change. You had to find a Trump to match his trump, and the right not to pass money bills is the only trump that is equally strong. So based on that rationale, 
Major portions of the government were shut down during the final weeks of December 1995 and the first week of January of the next year. The point that I believe is important is that the shutdown of government was not the result of a failure of the Congress to get its business done. Instead, it was a result of a calculated effort to exercise leverage in a dispute between Congress and the President. It was the result of a deliberate effort to trump the President's veto by refusing to pass money bills. Now that raises the obvious question of whether it was ever contemplated by the Founding Fathers that Congress could trump the President's veto in this manner. I took constitutional law when I was in law school and my understanding of the Constitution based on that course was that uh, if Congress wanted to trump the President's veto, it had to override the veto with a two-thirds vote of each House of Congress. The refusal to maintain funding of basic government services is not a legitimate trump available to the Congress. Instead, in my view, it's an abuse of the power granted to the people, granted by the people to the con Congress in the Constitution. I would like to report to you that this abuse of power by the Republican leadership in the Congress uh, in 1995 and 1996 was an isolated event that happened once in the Clinton administration. Unfortunately, last year we learned that it was not. In 2013, October of last year, the federal government again shut down because of the refusal of Republican leaders in the House to pass a continuing resolution. This time, the shutdown lasted from October 1 of 2013 to October 16. It was prompted by the, the demand that the President agree to delay or suspend the funding of the Affordable Care Act for a year as the price for getting a bill passed to maintain a functioning government. President Obama, as you would expect, objected to signing a bill that contained the, that provision, and the result was another government shutdown, which lasted 16 days. So that's uh, the refusal to appropriate money. Let me talk about the refusal to permit borrowing. This is a second new and abusive tactic that's been used in recent years by congressional leaders, Republican congressional leaders, uh, in refusing to allow the Secretary of Treasury to, to use uh, authority to borrow. In a logical sense, the Congress determines whether there is any need by the government to borrow by passing the laws that specify how much revenue we're going to raise, tax laws, royalty uh, laws, uh, tariffs, and also by passing laws specifying how much the government will spend. So if the Congress believes that the government is borrowing too much, it can either raise, the re raise revenue or it can cut spending. But in spite of this logic, for decades we have operated in this country with a statutorily imposed limit on the size of government debt. Now this debt limit, or debt ceiling as it's usually referred to, has never limited the ability of the government to incur obligations. It merely limits the ability of the government to pay for obligations that have already been incurred. The reality is that the debt ceiling has had to, has had to be raised many times in recent decades, and I voted to raise it many times. During most of the time I was in the Senate, there was general recognition and understanding by both parties that refusing to raise the debt ceiling as necessary to meet the obligations that the government had already incurred was not an option. However, beginning in 2013, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives determined to use the threat of not passing a debt ceiling increase as a way to gain leverage in negotiations with President Obama. In July of 2011, they demanded that the President agree to set, a, set to a set amount of deficit reduction as the quid pro quo for an increase in the debt ceiling. They insisted that they were willing to, uh, 
to allow the government to default on payments to bondholders or other government obligations if the president refused their demands. Unfortunately, when the dust settled on this manufactured crisis, it was clear that congressional Republicans had largely prevailed. They had forced the enactment of substantial spending cuts as the price for the government avoiding default on its obligations. In his victory statement on the Senate floor, Republican leader McConnell said, and this is a quote from his uh, floor statement, he said, I think some of our members may have thought the default issue was a hostage you might take a chance at shooting. Most of us didn't think that. What we did learn is this, it's a hostage that's worth ransoming. The General Accountability Office, uh, the Government Accountability Office, estimated that the threatened default and the delay in raising the debt limit uh, that, that last fall increased government borrowing costs by $1.3 billion. Uh, no, this was in 2011, not last fall. On August 5th of 2011, the Standard & Poor's issued its first ever downgrade of the federal government's debt rating as a result of this crisis. So this threatened refusal to, bar to allow borrowing by the Secretary of Treasury, which threatens default on government obligations, is to my mind a second significant new cause of the current dysfunction in the Congress. And finally, let me talk a little about the, abuse, the abusive use of the filibuster in the Senate. In the Senate, uh, my, my view is that this is a, another major cause of, of the current dysfunction uh, in that body. When I arrived in the Senate in uh, 1983, there were certainly instances where senators would assert their right to filibuster. It is not, however, it was not at that time a regular occurrence. That situation has changed very dramatically over the last 30 years. Today it's clear to anyone who follows the workings of the Senate that the threat of filibuster is used to prevent action on most significant legislative proposals. Today the threat of filibuster is not coming from only one or a few Republican senators. It usually is coming from the Republican leader. Republican leadership in the Senate objects, has during this Congress objected even to the approval of many non-controversial nominees by the President for mid-level positions in his administration. Those objections carry with them the threat to filibuster any attempt to bring those nominees up for a vote. Of course, as a result of the election yesterday, in the next Congress there will be no need to filibuster nominees because Senator McConnell, as Majority Leader, has the prerogative to just not bring them up for consideration. So these three changes in the internal functioning of the Congress have been major causes of its current dysfunction, in my opinion. That is, the refusal to appropriate money, the refusal to permit borrowing, and the excessive and abusive use of the filibuster in the Senate. During most of our nation's history, these factors did not afflict the Congress. And in my view, there's no reason that they need to continue to afflict the Congress in the future. There's no reason the Congress needs to continue hurtling from one self-imposed funding crisis to the next. So to summarize my views on this whole subject of failure by the federal government, uh, uh, I'll just reiterate that uh, there are undoubtedly many failures, many shortcomings in the policies and programs the federal government administers today. But there are also enormous benefits which some of those same policies and programs are providing. When we think about the failures of government, we need to think also not just about the failures of commission, but about the failures of omission. And finally, much of the dysfunction in Congress can be readily corrected by congressional leaders who will recognize that they have a bipartisan responsibility to do three things. Number one, keep the government functioning. 
Number two, ensure that the government honors the obligations it has already incurred. And three, refrain from using or threatening to use the filibuster except where there are genuine, heartfelt disagreements on issues of importance to the country. Uh, in my view, uh, the American people should demand that uh, senators and representatives they send to Washington uh, follow these general prescriptions. Thank you very much. Pleasure to speak to you. I was told there might be some questions or comments. I'm glad to respond if there are, please. Thank you, Senator. I wonder if you were there or even knowing about the arts over there in your party, what you would advise them to do with respect to the continuation of the strategies the Republicans used when they were in the jury in terms of dealing with what they're going to face now. Which of those things the Republicans have been doing to the Democrats would you abandon? Well, the reality is that uh, we have a Democratic president, and uh, the Democrats in this Congress are hoping to help, are generally supportive of the Democratic president's ability to implement his policies. So uh, a lot of the uh, obstacles and uh, uh, opposition that Republicans have have mounted against this president's efforts uh, are not going to be obviously mounted by, by Democrats, even though now they're in the minority rather than in the majority in the Senate. So uh, I think the, the real question is, after the next presidential election, uh, if you were to have a Republican president after the next presidential election, what, what policies would the Democrats then follow to resist those policies of a, of a Republican president. And, and uh, I would hope that they would follow these prescriptions. I, I cannot conceive, frankly, of uh, most Democratic members of the House or Senate uh, voting to refuse to fund the government. I cannot conceive of them voting to refuse to allow borrowing to, to meet the government's obligations. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, I, I remember a, a conversation, Jim Exon, I don't know if any of you are from Nebraska, is anybody from Nebraska? Jim, Jim Exon was a great senator and a good friend of mine, and I remember one day when we were having a vote on an increase in the debt ceiling, that uh, he was, uh, he and I were talking before, before the vote occurred, and I said, Jim, what are you going to do on this vote? He said, well, he said, my position on these debt ceiling increases is totally consistent. And I said, what is it? He says, when a Democratic president asks us to raise the debt ceiling, I vote for it. When a Republican president asks us to raise the debt ceiling, I let the Republicans vote for it. But, but it, I think what he was saying was that there was a general understanding we had to go ahead and do it. The Congress... The, the idea of refusing to raise the debt ceiling was not an option. It was a question of who was going to have to put the votes together to get it done. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there are 80 or 100 increases in the debt ceiling in the last uh, 60 years in the Congress. But uh, I can't conceive of Democrats purposely refusing to allow the increase in the debt ceiling. Uh, so that'd be my view. Now, the filibuster, uh, obviously, things that people feel strongly about, they're going to use the ability to filibuster to the extent that, that they have. Either party will. I, I just hope that some restraint can be exercised by the leaders of the two parties. Uh, a filibuster goes nowhere if the senator who wants to filibuster doesn't have the support of his or her leadership. Uh, on, on their side of the aisle. And, and so I think that the leaders, whether they're Republican leaders or Democratic leaders, need to, need to be uh, disciplined in not allowing use of filibuster, except where it's an important issue. Please. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm a Democrat, and I'm 
Uh, Senator, I wonder if you would mind turning your, um, the conversation to climate change, which I understand is the topic that is near and dear to your heart. Um, given the political situation we have right now, what do you see, uh, given, and given the frustration I think a lot of folks have with presenting overwhelming evidence from the International Panel on Climate Change on down that climate change is a, a real threat, um, where do you see the points of leverage right now? I mean, is anybody carrying the, the cap and trade banner? Uh, and uh, where else do you see points of leverage to uh, achieve some action? Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, the way I think about climate change are policies that respond to the problem of climate change. I put them in three categories. The first category is uh, policies to encourage more efficient use of energy and, and production of energy. And, and those are relatively easy politically. I mean, they're not easy, but nothing's easy, but they are, that's the easiest category. The second somewhat more difficult category is policies to improve the performance and lower the cost of non-emitting sources of energy, uh, which, uh, and again, you can get some bipartisan support for that. The third category is the one which is the real difficult nut to crack, and it is how do you put a price on carbon? Do you do it through a tax, or do you do it through a cap and trade system, or do you do it through some kind of clean energy standard? Uh, and, and that's where it's going to be very difficult for us to get the support in, in the next couple of years to, to make a major progress. Now, I think the most promising of those options for putting a price on carbon is, uh, to, is to develop a, uh, a neutral, revenue neutral carbon tax that could be included in a larger uh, tax reform package. I, th I think that that could, there are some Republicans who have spoken favorably about that. Uh, I, I just, uh, I know George Schultz, who is uh, out of the Hoover Institute now, has, has been very outspoken in favor of that approach. <clears throat> and I think, uh, I think it's, it's the most promising, but even that's gonna be very difficult. Yes? Senator, um, I have a question. It seems like uh, a lot of this I've seen even the speaker this morning is this idea of delegitimizing the government, whether it's... Is, is the idea of what? Uh, delegitimizing the government, whether it's the anti-climate uh, change rhetoric or Ted Cruz talking about, hey, we got the majority now in the Senate, let's go and impeach the president, uh, or this whole idea of defund, delegitimize, and destroy government. Um, there's just this rhetoric that runs all the way through it. How can we deal with that issue when it seems like we're getting totally bombarded? And I think in the next two years, we're really going to get bombarded now that Republicans have the Senate. How do we deal with this idea of not delegitimizing, but to build government or to be more pro-government in a way? I don't know. Does that make sense? Well, uh, you know, my own uh, experience is that there is pretty strong support across party lines for a lot of the specific things that the government does. Uh, whether it's programs like Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security, or uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, I think it's only the very, the general concept that the government needs to be uh, cut back in size, the government needs to be uh, kept out of uh, things. That, that, that's the concept which it seems to be very much in our culture and in our history. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think that's true with the Affordable Care Act. You know, when you, talk, when you talk to people about the Affordable Care Act, it's generally unpopular. When you talk to them about the specific provisions within it, uh, people are pretty, pretty supportive. Uh, so uh, I don't know exactly how you how you educate the American public about the specifics that are contained in it, but I think, I think that process is happening with regard to the Affordable Care Act. I think more and more people are learning that there are provisions in there that are beneficial and, and should have been enacted a long time ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator, I think you have 
We got one right back there, and then I'll get to you. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Senator, I have a question regarding my understanding that on the House side. The question is what now? Yeah, the, the question concerns a move on the part of the House in their proposed budget to cut uh, the IRS funding by 10% as a punitive measure for their uh, review of 504, 501c4 organizations, uh, which in fact they were legally obligated to do to you know, see if they were not overtly political organizations, uh, which would then result in probably several billion dollars of uncollected taxes. And uh, I don't know, perhaps you have those actual figures, but do you have any comment regarding this move on the part of the House to make that 10% cut? Well, yeah, well, my, my comment uh, would be that this is an example of the kind of difficult decision that the President's going to have to be making over the next couple of years because he's going to be sent. <clears throat> proposed spending bills by the, both the House and Senate now with provisions like that included in them. And he's going to have to make the same kind of judgment calls that President Clinton made back when he was president, and that is which of these provisions are so uh, unwise and damaging to the country that uh, I need to veto the bill and tell him to go back and do it again. And, and so that's what, what I'm concerned about is that we try to head off more of these government shutdowns and more of these uh, threats to, uh, to default on the debt uh, as we uh, continue to negotiate these issues. Well, just a quick follow-up on that. Would the Senate uh, go along with that? Well, they, they wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't think that the, the Senate would, uh, but again, uh, you know, you can do a lot of these spending provisions as part of a reconciliation bill where you only need 51 votes to get it to the President. So it's very possible that they could get a bill to the President with a provision like that included. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, go ahead. Well, I, I, I can somewhat understand why young people would, would be reluctant to, uh, uh, to choose this as a, as a career at this point. I mean, to choose public service as a career if you're working for the IRS and they're going to get their budget cut by 10%. Uh, uh, you know, your, your job security is, is not that good. And, uh, uh, I do think that we've got, we've had such a drumbeat of rhetoric about government being the problem ever since uh, Reagan uh, made that speech in his uh, State of the Union uh, very early in his administration where he said that government's not the solution, government's the problem. Uh, and and that, uh, that general uh, drumbeat has continued. So uh, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a long, difficult job to push back against that. I, I wish I had a 25-word solution to that problem, but I don't. All right, thank you all very much for inviting me.